From earaches to strep tests, there's Minute Clinic at CVS. See a provider, fill a prescription, and grab essentials. Or see us online with telehealth options. That's healthier made easier. Visit Minute Clinic at CVS today. Services vary by location. See MinuteClinic.com for details. Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Monday morning edition of the Boneyard. Uh, getting this up a little bit early because, number one, I want to go to bed a little earlier, but also, two, many of you are driving today on your way to Omaha. As I modulate this up just a little bit there. And so I wanted to make sure you got some listening material. I know a lot of people are like, hey, Steve, I wasn't expecting that Sunday Boneyard. So I got a little uh, Steve Robertson overload. And you know what? That's a good thing. You need more Steve Robertson in your life. So here we are uh, on the Monday edition. A lot to talk about. As always, as we prepare to go compete for a national championship. And, man, doesn't it just feel fun to say that? I mean, it's got such a nice ring to it. Mississippi State will play for a national championship. And I don't mean in the context that many others do. You know, it's, well, you know, everybody that's in the tournament's got a chance to win a national championship. No, we're in the national championship series. We're in the College World Series finals for just the second time in our history. We've had some other opportunities to play for it all. Hadn't quite gotten there. So here we are, about to go do something great. The Sea of Maroon is here, and reinforcements are on the way. And uh, I can see and feel your presence, but I wanted to give you guys a a couple of things, too. I I have uh, befriended some of the employees that kind of helped, you know, put game day together there at TD Ameritrade, and we have won many of them over. The guy that runs the hotel here where I stay, the manager here, where I've been for a few days now, has gone to four College World Series games this year. He has adopted Mississippi State as his team. He shares with me, as an astute follower of baseball, that Mississippi State is the most well-rounded team in the tournament, and he knew that maybe two games into this thing. He goes, man, the Mississippi State team just has so much heart. He goes, it's easy to root for those guys. And, you know, hey – I'm glad that we have the support. I also think it's fair to say that everybody outside of the Ole Miss fan base, and even some of them, are going to be cheering for us. But I would say everybody outside of Vanderbilt fans and uh, Ole Miss fans will be cheering for Mississippi State. I have seen some very positive messages from some Ole Miss fans that are actually pretty good sports, probably better sports than me. They said, hey, I'd like to see those guys win it. There are some other people that have some selfish motives saying, you know what, maybe this will get Ole Miss uh, more committed to baseball. I don't know how they can be, but that's the – that's part of the narrative out there. But um, you know, the people of Omaha have kind of wrapped their arms around your team. They love these guys. And a lot of people, too, are still very upset about what's happened with NC State. It's a difficult decision. There's enough blame to go around. But it's been an unconventional College World Series. It's just one of those things that happens. And you look at it, it just, you know, here we were thinking, you know, we had this COVID mess kind of behind us for the most part, and then we get slapped in the face with it. And that's not to say – that it couldn't have been handled better. It absolutely could have been handled better. <clears throat> but uh, at the end of the day, it didn't affect our side of the bracket. And I have read some of these people on, on social media that said, oh, Mississippi State and uh, Texas and Vanderbilt should have just in solidarity refused to play. Listen, th- there are some dumb things that are said in life, and that's among the dumbest. It's got nothing to do with our side of the bracket. You, know, you, you want to go jump on Vandy, which I don't think is fair either. I mean, their their kids are ready to play, and you don't have to like them. You can say, you know what, those guys are getting some financial aid packages that other people around the country aren't. That's probably fair. But it, those young men that have got there and competed, they didn't ask for any of this. And there were some rumors out there that uh, Tim Corbin was involved in this whole process of uh, of testing NC State. I, I'm told that's completely false. I think, I think Vandy is often a convenient villain. And listen, Tim Corbin doesn't help himself with some of the things that he says. You know, he came out and made the comment the other day, and I've got some other things we'll talk about later in the show uh, after the first break about uh, today's Vanderbilt press conference. But, you know, I don't think Corbin handled himself well with the NC State stuff. Not that he needs my approval or anything. But, you know, when he came out and said, hey, you know what, we're still playing. It's a positive result for us. We're, we're moving on. We don't care how it looks. Uh, you know, that's, that's just poor form. It is. And as some, I, I made a comment to somebody else in the media. I said, you know, we should have just come out and said, hey, listen, you know, we, we sympathize with NC State. It's not those kids' fault, you know, that um, did what they were supposed to do. It's unfair to them and those fans that, 
you know, shelled out thousands of dollars and came up here to go watch their team compete for a national championship. I mean, that's been yanked out from one of those people too. But instead, it's like, hey, we don't care. We're still playing. We don't care how it looks. You guys can eat it. That's how it comes off. Very arrogant, condescending. I think everybody involved in this thing has some sympathy for NC State and at least have shown some. What if it had been us? What if we get here and, and all of a sudden you think, man, this is our best team ever. It's our best chance to win a natty. And then on your way to the ballpark, you get a text message that says, hey, the game has been canceled because uh, we're not going to play. It's done. And, and you know that, that comes out at 1 in the morning after you've already made that drive. Maybe you're driving through the night and you get up and get ready to go to a ball game and you find out your team's College World Series run is over. I'd be I'd be miffed. I'd be upset. I'd be heartbroken. Be heartbroken for me and for you, but mainly for our players. You know, they're the ones that have went through all these workouts and, you know, had to kind of fit a social life around all that stuff, too. I mean, listen, these these guys live like kings on campus, but, uh, you know, the effort they put in and the commitment they make, I don't know that there is a sport that puts in more hours in baseball. You you got Cape Cod League, you got the season, the season lasts all the way, and if you play well, it lasts all the way to July. Then, you know, then you get... You go to Cape Cod, then you're right back in school, and then the next thing you know, you're in fall ball workouts. I mean, it is pretty much a year-round thing, and that's not to be disrespectful to football. Those guys work exceptionally hard, too, as do all of our student-athletes. But because of the way the baseball season sets up, I mean, these guys, they don't get a lot of rest. And so when you begin to think about all they put into it, to have it pulled out from under them, it's, it's, it's very concerning. And I just think that there are a lot of people who could have been a lot more sensitive to that. I don't envy the decisions that the NCAA had to make about that, and I'm not here to defend them. But I think at the same time, too, you know, if you're Vanderbilt or Mississippi State or Texas, you say, hey, listen, do you really expect us to go out there and play an intercollegiate baseball game with players that have COVID? Because some of those guys were symptomatic. It wasn't just a false positive. That was some of the things that came out. I thought Kendall Rogers did a great job of kind of getting to the bottom of some of this and kind of telling the backstory, you know, their coach admitted in the post game they had some guys that had a bug. So it wasn't just as simple as everybody's doing great and feeling great and don't even know they have it and they just happened to get a, a positive test and it was a shock to everybody. These are guys that actually had some symptoms. And so would we really have wanted those guys to go play with symptoms, exhibiting symptoms around your players? I wouldn't. And so we all knew the rules before the tournament began. This is how it's all set up. This is what we're going to do. This is the protocol. This is if this happens, then this is what the result is. So we all knew the rules. And you can't change them here at the end and say, oh, it just doesn't seem fair. I mean, you know, it is what it is. And so, yeah, Vanderbilt benefits from that. They get an extra day of rest. We played another ball game. You know, so there's advantages to both. I would much rather have been able to save Will Bednar uh, for game one. But again, it is what it is. You piece it together. Christian McLeod's going to be your starter in game one for Mississippi State. I had a great start to the ball game at Vanderbilt on Friday night. Struck out seven the first time through the order. And then suddenly, I don't know if he lost his, his release point or whatever, he had difficulty throwing the breaking ball for a strike, which couldn't keep him off the fastball. And they punched him out of the ball game. So my hope is he's learned from that because this is you know, potentially his last start in a Mississippi State uniform, you know, that he can go out there and, uh, and throw winning baseball for us. It's a big ballpark. He ought to be able to keep people in the yard. He did struggle to miss bats against Virginia. And I give Virginia a lot of credit for their scouting. You know, so we'll see what happens with Vanderbilt. But, um, you know, that's who we're going to throw. Uh, I don't think you can rule, rule, Bed- rule Will Bednar out for the championship series. I know that he wants the baseball. Probably wouldn't see him before Wednesday, but I know that he wants the baseball. I could almost see a situation, too. Let's say the Mississippi State uh, gets a win on Monday and throws Landon Sims. Maybe you bring Will Bednar in to close out game two. That's just me, you know, spitballing there. Nobody's told me that. But, you know, the bottom line is, is that, uh, you know, I don't think you've seen the last of Will Bednar. So we'll just kind of wait and see how he recovers. But uh, I know that he wants the ball. I know his teammates want him to have the ball. He's our guy. And so when the season and the game or the championship's on the line, you'd love to have your guy out there that uh, can shut people down. 
Let's thank our good friends from Bulldog Burger Company. I'm really looking forward to getting back, uh, but not without a championship trophy. You know what I'm saying? I, I, we're going to be here for the duration of this tournament. And so I am eager to get back. I do miss Starkville. I miss many of my friends, but I share with people, I, I, I'm not ready to see you guys. I miss you, but I'm not ready to see you unless you're coming to Omaha. Because I'm where I want to be. But when I get back, I'm going to Bulldog Burger Company. Probably the first meal I have when I get back is going to be Bulldog Burger Company. Uh, I've enjoyed eating up here, but it's not the same. And to be blunt with you, I haven't even had a hamburger up here because I just don't think anything would compare. And so I'm looking forward to getting back. You should be there now. And if you want to go watch a ball game, maybe take the family up there to Bulldog Burger Company. Three locations now, right there on Lake Harbor Drive and Ridge one, which is the brand new one. Getting rave reviews from our fans. People, many people said, you know what, Steve, I had never eaten there before because sometimes it's difficult to get into the one in Starville on game day. So we gave it a shout out here in central Mississippi. And you're right, it's great. And I wouldn't partner with somebody that wasn't. They're absolutely great. Also, a location on Gloucester Street there in Tupelo. Go by, have the spring rolls. They do make you better looking. Somebody tweeted that to me, and it is, it's just scientific fact. It'll make you better looking. It'll make everybody around you better looking. It'll make you feel better about life. Go have the spring rolls. They're magical. Find your own favorites. Some people like the smokehouse. I'm a big fan of the pimentology, add bacon, and some people are a little bit scared of that. They say, Steve, I don't like pimento and cheese sandwiches. You know what? I don't either. I hate them. I hate them, and every time they had them at dinner on the grounds at church, I would always avoid that plate because I didn't want anybody to pull it on my on my plate. Because you know your mom's like, "Oh, you gotta eat everything before you get a dessert plate." But the pimentology at bacon is outstanding, absolutely outstanding. You're looking for a hearty meal. Maybe you hadn't eaten all day. You want to go have that shut down meal to make you feel good. Go have that pimentology at bacon. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M E A T. So we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, Vandy press conference today. Well, you know, one of the things, I'll be honest with you, I mean, I'm in the industry, so I feel like it's fair for me to kind of talk about this. But, you know, I enjoy hearing coaches talk about the other team. What do you like about them? What do you not like about them? And, of course, you get a lot of coach speak, but as you're getting ready to prep for a game, it's always interesting to kind of know what the other coach thinks and other players think. There weren't a lot of those questions asked. And I, and I got a little irritated earlier this week with uh, with the Texas media you know, it's like I mean, you, you got David Pierce up there and those guys have survived an elimination game. You're getting ready to go play Mississippi State again uh, for the third time this year. There weren't a single question asked about Mississippi State. I mean, it's like, why don't you just ask him, what it, you, know, you know, David, do you like sweet tea? When you go to pizza, what do you order? Does pineapple go on a pizza? I mean, you know, it's like that kind of stuff. I just think to myself, you know, you can save, hey, wh- what does a team look like next year? And, hey, isn't Texas great? David, do you have a don't mess with Texas bumper sticker on your truck? I mean, it's like that kind of, I mean, and I'm, I'm, I'm using a little hyperbole here. I'm a little over the top with that questioning. But it's like you're getting ready to play a team that's beaten you twice in a game that could send you home. And you don't even think to ask a single question about the next game. It's like we want to spend all this time talking about next year and talking about hey you know coach can you talk about this kid to hear how much you love him and how great he is and how wonderful we are and doesn't Texas A&M stink I mean, you know it's like that kind of stuff it just it blows my mind well Corbin got a few questions about Mississippi State today and I, I, to be honest with you I, you know I, I'm not, not real impressed now, not that Tim needs uh, my approval again but um you know, I just think he, maybe he needs a class in public speaking. I don't know. He he just doesn't come off as a guy that um, wants to talk about a whole lot outside of his own team. But I do think it's interesting with his opening statement, he feels the need to talk about the NC State situation. I believe there was probably some direction or perhaps some reflection on his own part about how they had handled it earlier in the week. The whole comment I shared with you earlier, you know, basically, <clears throat> we're we're moving on. We have a positive result. We don't care how it looks. Uh, no matter how that was intended, it was interpreted in a very negative way. So I thought Corbin came out today and tried to kind of clarify some of that. <clears throat> he says, start with North Carolina first. We certainly sympathize with their team, their fan base too, understanding we don't know the level of hurt that they are exposed to right now, but we certainly recognize it. None of us wish to be in this particular position. We're one of six teams that were matched up with them. We certainly would want to play them on the field or have played them on the field, but we didn't. So we are in this situation where we move forward. We've lost one time. We handled our business appropriately. 
We try to stay in our lane as best we possibly can. We're grateful to be in the championship series against a team that we're familiar with and played during the course of the year. So we'll move forward. You know, not exactly, you know, a Shakespearean sonnet, you know, of emotion there. But I do feel at least he acknowledges it. I think it, again, kind of taking a second swing at the fact that um, probably made some insensitive comments the day before. And someone would say, well, Steve, you're being awfully sensitive yourself. I know I'm not. I just think in that situation, when you begin to think about the framework of the, the anguish and the unprecedented nature of that decision, when you get out there and say, we don't care how it looks, I, I just think it's very flippant. All right, so let's get a little deeper into what Corbin had to say today. They did ask about vaccinations, and uh, I was told Vandy's not 100%. Mississippi State's not either. I was told last night Texas is the only team in the Final Four that was fully vaccinated, which is kind of interesting. Uh, I was told, too, by somebody on, on the cuff, kind of on the slide, that one of the reasons that some of the other players have not been vaccinated is because they're kind of fearful of symptoms. Because, you know, if some of us, and, and I've, I've talked about this before, you know, when I got my second shot, I was down for the count for about 36 hours. And, you know, we're playing. You're trying to get your team to Omaha. And so you're thinking, if I take this shot, you know, what if I miss a weekend? What what, what if I'm down for the count for a couple of days and I can't help the team? We're trying to get to Omaha. So I understand that side of it, too. I know other people are saying, oh, it's been available to everybody. You know, listen, it's a very personal decision. You know, it's easy for us. We just, you know, us work a day folks to say, you know what, if I don't feel good, I can take a sick day. You know, we're not similarly situated. We don't have the same pursuits. But Corbin says, uh, we're very comfortable with the situation we've gone through during the course of this year. I've spent a lot of time educating the group with this process and what it could look like at the beginning of the year. We're certainly comfortable with where we are and what we've done. So it's really kind of a non-answer there because they were being asked, did you require your guys to be vaccinated because you're a private school? So really a non-answer there. Again, on the NC State thing. Tim, going back to Friday, when you find out about NC State's situation, what were the discussions between you and the officials? What were you told, and did you have any input at all? And I thought that was an important question because there were a lot of rumors out there that Vandy had essentially demanded, Tim Corbin personally had demanded to have NC State tested again. And as I've shared with you guys, there have been rumors since, I guess, Monday or Tuesday. I mean, the days all run together. But I guess after their second game, which would have been Monday, that NC State had a player that was sick. And, of course, uh, Coach Avent mentions that in the postgame. And so, from what I'm told, that is what prompted the testing. You know, everybody, every non-vaccinated player tests already every 48 hours. But because of the fact that it appeared that there may be an issue within the team, it required a little further research. So, again... Uh, if it was Tim Corbin involved in that, it is. there's a lot of people covering for him that have no reason to cover for him. So I don't believe he had anything to do with that. And, again, I know what's been said on social media, and a lot of that's just sour grapes. I mean, everybody's emotionally invested in this, and some things go wrong, and we all look for somebody to blame. You know, sometimes there is nobody to blame. You know, sometimes things just happen beyond our control. Bad things happen to good people all the time. It doesn't always mean they're at fault. But, you know, again, Corbin responds to that. Hey, not much, talking about his input. They were handling a situation with NC State. We were told the game was going to be delayed. Kumar was already ready in the bullpen. He was getting ready to pitch. We couldn't give him much information outside of the fact that the game was going to be delayed. We didn't have a hard start time, so we had no idea when that would be. We knew there was a health issue, but we didn't know what it was, nor I guess should we. We just knew the game was going to be delayed. But our players didn't know much, so we kept them back in the locker room and waited until we got some type of word. Then I would say 45 minutes to an hour, probably closer to 45 minutes. We were told the game would start in 45 minutes. So we let our pitcher know, let the team know, they regrouped and took the field. That's one thing that I'll say, too, and I think I touched on this last night. You know, the game should never have been delayed. And the reason that I say that is, again, based on what we know and assuming what what is being reported is correct, and I believe that it is. If we knew we had an issue on Monday night and into Tuesday morning, why do we have to wait until till Friday to get our Thursday night to get that resolved? Does that make sense? You know, or you know, whatever day it was. I guess they were supposed to play on, um, yeah, Friday. So if we knew on Monday at the latest Tuesday morning that we may potentially have an issue and you can turn these testing results back right away, 
why did it take till Friday to get it resolved? If we knew we had the issue, why did we let them continue to interact and continue to kind of run the tournament? I, I think there should have been some expediency on behalf of the, the medical community here, no matter who's in charge of that, whether it be the NCAA or uh, you know, the, the, the county people here, whatever. There should have been more expediency done here. It shouldn't have drug on the way that it should. Because that was the, one of the reasons, if you recall, that we had 20 approved regional host sites is so they could handle rapid testing results. And so if you've got guys on Monday with an issue, you ought to be able to test them on Tuesday morning and have your information uh, by noon or later. But either way, Tuesday's a dead day for those guys. And so, again, I don't know I have all the details, but I can't understand, I can't really wrap my mind around the fact that it took so long for that to happen probably cost a lot of people some money for sure all right so let's get into the next part of this so so again this is about the timing of you know when they found out because you know we were wrapping up with texas when they made the announcement that the game was going to be ruled a no contest corbin says he had no clue until later he goes well nobody was awake i woke up about 1 30 and found a message from Candace, that's the athletic director at Vanderbilt, regarding the NCAA's decision. At that point right there, I rolled over and woke my wife up, and we stayed up the rest of the night and just talked because we wanted to process it. I felt like when the boys woke up, I wanted to give them some information, and that's really all I cared about was them. And Again, uh, as far as getting up and seeing that type of message, you know, um, with the understanding that they were going to play and then not playing, I just wanted to get them as quickly as possible. So we did. And listen, everybody's got a singleness of purpose here. You know, your primary function obviously is your team. You know, but either way, I'm not going to pick apart his message there. Uh, again, I just, you know, uh, I, I'm sure it's a little, I'm back to the quotes. I'm sure it's a little bit confusing, but we used yesterday as a day to talk it through. And I told them once we get to the ballpark today, we move forward. It's just like life. There's nothing you can do about it. Life circumstances happen. Uh, you deal with it, you move forward. And that's true. And I'm a firm believer in the fact this is not a situation of Vandy's making, even though they benefit. They truly benefit from the situation. And, and I don't. again, I don't think they had anything to do with this additional round of testing. I, to be fair with all this, I think the NCAA did their job here. One of the, I mean, the number, what's the number one priority of a governing body when it comes to athletics? The number one priority is player safety. Number one, player safety is number one. Number two is to ensure that the game is officiated fairly, and that's debatable at times. But the number one issue is player safety. And so they get word, maybe even secondhand, maybe the folks at NC State hadn't been truly forthcoming until the press conference happens. Next thing you know, everybody's asking questions. And so they investigate. Yeah, they may have drugged their feet a little bit, but once they discovered they had an issue, they took decisive action. We don't all agree with it. But at the end of the day, they acted on the behalf of the other players to protect the other teams. And so while it's an unpopular decision and while it's heartbreaking, you know, the NCAA has to consider other teams in addition to NC State. It's not just about the North Carolina State experience. It's about the rest of the teams in the field and their experience and their potential to be exposed to what could potentially be a life-threatening illness. So they did their jobs. At the end of the day, they did their jobs. All right, so let's get a little lower, deeper into the press conference because all this other stuff is not really important. Again, you know, like, Tim, who's your favorite animaniac? Did you like the Spice Girls? Whatever. Um, so they asked him about Kumar Rocker, and he gave a really short answer here. How confident are you Kumar can come back on short rest, and how does his off-season conditioning uh, set him up to be able to do this. And the only word he responds is confident. We're going to see Kumar on Wednesday. And I would just about bet if Mississippi State wins a game on Monday, we're going to see him on Tuesday. And I know that everybody's going to come out and say, oh, I can't believe this is just, you know so crazy that he would throw so quickly. Listen, guys, it's an NFL championship series. It's all hands on deck. And you know Kumar Rocker's going to want the baseball. If their medical people can clear him, then that's fine. You know, we would want the same thing. I mean, we'll, we're going to expect Will Bednar to throw on Wednesday. It's basically the same number of days rest. But, yeah, we're going to see Kumar Rocker. You might as well get, expect that. Kind of go ahead and get prepared. I don't know what, what version of him we're going to get, but we're going to see him. So, 
they asked him about us making our changes because, you know, you guys are well aware that it's after the NC State thing. You know, we had the big win the other night. You know, they had the big uh, receiving line there at the team hotel and everybody kind of welcomed the team and you're clapping and high-fiving and that sort of stuff. Well, to be sure that the player safety burden was met, Mississippi State officials elected to go into a different entrance and not really have that receiving line. And listen, the players love it. They do. They love being loved on and being appreciated, but um, got to protect them. We're getting ready to go play for a national championship. You can get your autograph a little bit later, okay? Um, but they asked him, you know, did you did you change? And he goes, no, we're in the double tree. We're fine. I, I guess the double tree is great. But um, uh, nevertheless, they hadn't made any, any changes. But, again, I, I'm told that their vaccination rate is really high at Vanderbilt. I don't think it's 100%, but it is really high. He finally gets a Mississippi State question. You mentioned being familiar with Mississippi State. You played them three times this year. Can you tell us that since then, what have you seen and maybe in this run about what has made them so dangerous and led them on this path? Corbin's answer, I don't think they've changed much. I think they're just a very consistent ball club. That's a seasoned team. They have offensive players that have played a long time. Pardon me here, which is not true. Rowdy and Tanner are very, very good players. That is true. I just mentioned those two because we played against them in 2018 in that Super. Uh, I, you know, again, and I, I guess I am being critical of Tim Corbin here, but I have been amazed at how little people know about our team. I was on a, uh, a radio show earlier, and the guy before me was a Vanderbilt guy and was talking about how we're a veteran team. Guys, we got two guys that have Omaha experience. Josh Hatcher has a little bit. Began to run this thing down. Brad Cumbus didn't play in 2019. Cameron James was still in high school. Lane Forsyth was still in Humboldt, Tennessee. Scotty DeBrule was at Jacksonville. Luke Hancock didn't play. Logan Tanner wasn't on the team. But yet we've got all these guys with all these Omaha experience. We don't. They got more Omaha experience than us. It's amazing to me. Everybody up here is young. That's all I ever hear. Everybody, it's like forever young. Every team here is young. That's what everybody says. Oh, we're young. We're young. We're young. Guys, we got a bunch of guys that have never had never been through the SEC until this year. We had a bunch of guys that were basically bench warmers a couple of years ago when we made this trip. They're great players for us now. So they have the experience of at least making the trip and watching the game from the dugout. They didn't have the experience of stepping into a batter's box in front of 25,000 people screaming their name. And so, no, we're not this experienced team people make us out to be. I find all that stuff to be laughable. All right, let's get back to it. So, <clears throat> so back to Corbin. Uh, we go to their lineup. They're like us. They, ha- they have just got some really, really good players who compete really well. That's true. Their pitching staff is like ours. That, that's mostly true. They've got quality starters. They've got quality arms out of the bullpen. They take care of the baseball, and they've been here. Like Vanderbilt, they've been there. They may have a few more pieces that have been playing on the field than Vanderbilt. Again, not true, but at the same time, they've been in the College World Series before. They've experienced it, know what it feels like, and know how to operate. Very good team. A lot of those comments are pretty canned. You know, a lot of coach speak in that, too. Uh, and not that I ever expect a coach to come out there and be honest and say, oh, yeah, this guy stinks, and we know this guy's going to strike out on a slider in the dirt. You know, they're never going to say that. But I just find it interesting. So he was then asked, too, about the SEC. You know, how, What are your thoughts about an all-SEC final? That's a pretty good thing for the league and for the conference. So Corbin responds, it's exciting that way, and as far as the SEC is concerned, we're very proud to be in that conference. But we don't stand here and beat ourselves on the chest and say this is the best conference in the country. What you do is what you do. We're very proud to be part of something that is celebrated for the kids and on a network and how we play the game of baseball. At the same time, it's joyous for both communities to be here together. I certainly respect Mississippi State a great deal. I enjoy their fan base. We have many friends from Mississippi State, and we'll stay that way. But we're just proud. We're proud to represent our bracket, number one. I think moving forward from the great teams that were here in our bracket and then to play here at the end, so happy to be lined up against a very good opponent, opponent, we're very grateful and fortunate. Again, I think it's a pretty good comment there. But I think we're all proud to be in the SEC. And to be honest with you, I think Vanderbilt probably should be the most happy to be in the SEC, considering that college baseball is about the only thing they contribute to in the Southeastern Conference. You know, so... If you didn't have baseball, you wouldn't have anything other than helping us uh, bring up the conference GPA. 
But again, you know, listen, it is a great thing for both communities. And I think it is a cool thing because of this Vanderbilt thing. There's, there is some bitterness on both sides, despite what you may hear. You know, we don't like the scholarship thing. They don't like us pointed out. But they've also had the better of us the last couple of years. And um, so, you know, we've got to figure that out. It's a chance to do it this week. So they asked him about pitching. How does your starting pitching set up this week? And it's Christian Little a factor in the rotation. He said, starting pitching sets up fine. Everyone's a factor. You know, Christian Little uh, started that ball game another night against Stanford. Did not have a good start. They got to him. And the guy's got some ability. He's young. Body language wasn't really good. Moment may have been a little bit too big for him, but he's going to be a dude for them. Just go and get ready for that. So they, they asked him a little bit about the rivalry, too. You guys have played some significant games, even in the postseason against Mississippi State in recent years. I know you've got a young team, again, the young team thing, but a lot of them have only really played in that series uh, back a couple months ago. Is this developing into a good rivalry, given all the stakes you played against them? Corbin, I mean, they're just a good opponent. What a rivalry is, I have no idea. I like the fact, uh, maybe I can explain it to him. Uh, I like the fact that we play very good baseball in a good conference and the fact that we potentially could play them five, six times or what have you. It's fine. It's a good thing for our conference. But we enjoy playing good opponents. Mississippi State is more than a good opponent. They're tremendous competitors. Again, very respectful comment there. But, you know, the, yeah, it's so one of the things I've learned about that too is, you know, the, the best way to needle your rival about stuff is to, to suggest that it's not a rivalry. They don't matter to you. Uh, if you don't think there's some backdrop behind this thing between the two schools and, uh, you know, about all the scholarship stuff, you're kidding yourself. They know it. We know it. And that's okay. And uh, there's a part of me, I think, too, if we go out there and beat them, I think Corbin can say, well, you know what, you can't complain about my scholarships anymore because you beat me. And you know what, I'd be just fine with him making that comment because we'll be national champions. Uh, the next comment was to clarify, is Jack your guy tomorrow? Corbin says, I have not clarified that. I've never said that. We'll see how he feels today, and then we'll determine who's going to pitch. But we need time today. These kids have thrown a lot as of late. We'll just take care of the health of the kids first before we determine who is going to start. Well, let me just tell you this. The, the, the word for days has been uh, Jack Leiter on Monday, Riley on Tuesday, and Kumar on Wednesday. That, that's been the word. That, that's been the talk of Omaha uh, for the better part of four, four days now. So, I suspect that's what you'll see. I think Leiter is a lock to throw on Monday. And then, depending on whether they win or lose, that'll determine who throws on Tuesday. I think they'd love to be able to get out of this thing without throwing Kumar. But you better believe if we get into a winner-take-all game on Wednesday, we're going to see Kumar Rocker. I want to get into a couple other things, speaking of Kumar Rocker, before we kind of move on here. He also met with the media today. And... uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I guess I'm going to step on some toes today, and, and I guess that'll be okay. There are a lot of people that have strong opinions about people they've never met. Now, it's one of the things when they're public figures. But, uh, you yeah, know, listen, I, I judge people basically on their on-the-field behavior, their talent, and then, you know, kind of how they handle the media. Not that anybody owes me anything, but I, you, you can only kind of, you know, evaluate people based on what you see. Uh, I'm not hanging out with Kumar Rocker. We're not going to have coffee together. I don't know what kind of person he is. I don't. But I do know this. I know that uh, I thought it was a little bit silly to be flexing on the mound for striking out walk-ons against NC State in a ball game that Vanderbilt should have won going away. It's a 3-1 ball game. It's a 3-1 game. It'd be one thing if you're, you know, if you were striking out, you know, five hitters in a row from Florida. I just thought it was poor form. And, again, they don't need my approval. But uh, Kumar met with the media today. A lot of really deadpan answers here. Didn't get asked a lot about Mississippi State. He had two questions about State. He gave the exact same answer. Mississippi State doesn't like to strike out very much. And so he followed up and they asked him basically the same question another way. And he says Mississippi State doesn't like to strike out a lot. Well, that's true. I don't know anybody that likes to strike out a lot. You know, we're the team that strikes out the fewest. So I don't know what that means. I mean, I don't know where we're going with that. It's on, it's basically a, you know, meaningless comment. So we'll just kind of push forward and see how that works. But, but he didn't have much to say. The one guy who had a lot more to say about Mississippi State was Dominic Keegan, who was having a great college World Series. I believe he has six hits so far in Omaha, and uh, he's been a dude for them for a while. Plays first base, has had some defensive issues, 
and people continue to tell me that they are struggling a little bit with the playing surface here. When you play all your games on that turf, you know, it's it's a little different. But uh, they have had trouble at times kind of fielding the ball on the hop, and, and Keegan has had a couple of errors. Uh, but they asked him, you know, about you know, what do you remember about Mississippi State's pitching staff and, and what makes them so difficult? Well, they're competitors. All the guys throw pretty hard. They've got good breaking stuff. Well, that's true. And they kind of mentioned about, you know, you get a little deeper in this thing about, uh, you know, what do you guys need to do to get the offense going against Mississippi State? We just got to stop putting pressure on ourselves. We're here for a reason. We earned our spot here, and we got here because of our abilities and what we can do. So just not putting pressure on ourselves and having fun. When this group's having fun, I think we're at our best. That's probably a fair comment. And there is a lot of pressure here. And I, and I read some numbers earlier today. The first week in Omaha, Vanderbilt hit a cool, crisp 217. Mississippi State hit a cool, crisp 215. So both offenses have really struggled. And a lot of that, too, is the quality of the pitching. The team that gets the offense going is going to win an after championship. And I don't even think you've got to have it going, you know, you're running like a faucet either. I think you've got to get it going more than a drip, though. I mean, that's the thing, you know, we we have really struggled to have the big inning. And that's kind of been our deal all year long. It's like unless somebody really helps us and kind of walks some people, commits some errors, we have a tough time kind of stringing hits together. It's going to be very difficult to string hits together against Vanderbilt. So it's I expect some low-scoring games. There we do. So a little bit later, and they asked him about Mississippi State. You guys have played some really important series against Mississippi State, kind of like the rivalry question again. And a good answer from Dominic Keegan. I, I think we're just two teams that are very talented and like to compete. No one's going to give in to each other. I don't know if I'd call it a rivalry, but it, I just call it two teams that are talented and compete. Every game is important, so I wouldn't say game one's more important than game two or three. You've got to go out there and you got to compete every single day. Now, again, kind of a bit of a canned answer, but uh, listen, Van- Mississippi State has Vanderbilt's attention. There's no question. And it's not just because we're in a national championship. They understand that we're a quality team. And, yeah, they beat, they beat us up there. But I think at the same time, too, that they, if they're honest with themselves, we gave them that Sunday game. We did. We should have taken the series. And if they're honest about that, they'll come out and say, you know what, we should have lost that series, so we better bring our A game. If they come out here thinking, hey, it's the same old Mississippi State team, they're going to get beat. You go ahead and mark that down. Time for the new uh, top ten list from johnnypacker.com. Listen, if you're looking for sunglasses, and I know you are, it's summertime. Many of you have, are wearing those same cheap sunglasses from a year ago or two years ago, and they barely stay on your face. They don't fit your face. You probably bought them at some gas station somewhere, or somebody gave them to you as a Father's Day gift, and they got it in some little giveaway, whatever. Invest in yourself. Invest in your vision. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I didn't take care of my eyes for many, many years. I wear my sunglasses now just about everywhere I go, and it's not a fashion statement. I'm trying to protect my vision. I spend a lot of time behind the computer screen and a lot of time on the road staring at the sun. So I'm trying to protect myself. You should, too. Buy yourself some fashionable eyewear at johnnypacker.com. All of the frames are named after Mississippi Towns. Maybe that appeals to you. Maybe it doesn't. But the frames themselves will. The construction will. The fit will. They're not going to pinch your nose. They're going to ride well on your face. Very, very high-quality merchandise. Visit the website today. That's johnnypacker.com. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll save you a little cash. Use promo code BONEYARD. That'll get you 10% off your purchase. And the blue light glasses are now on the website. Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe you've been curious about that. Do a little research. I think you'll find you'll be a little interested in, in kind of learning more about that. If you have questions, hit them on the Contact Us link. And if you see your favorite frames unavailable or sold out, don't distress. Hit that contact us thing and say, hey, listen, I'd like to order these. They'll put you on order. Because, listen, they're trying to keep up with the demand, but you guys have been buying a lot of sunglasses. And so, again, uh, I always remind you, too, I'm a firm believer in the Cystic Vibrosis Foundation. I've done a lot of work with them over the years. And, you know, John Packer has dealt with this his whole life. And rather than just say, you know what, hey, this is my lot in life, uh, he has fought for his life, and now he's fighting for others. A portion of of the profits of each purchase will be donated directly to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. So not only are you getting some high-quality eyewear at a good price from some Mississippi State folks, you're doing something to help the quality of life for somebody else. So again, that's johnnypacker.com, promo code BONEYARD. I'm pretty proud of this list, guys. I, I was So I, I'm a firm believer when I ride around or I'm 
you know, I'm at a place. I love having my phone where I can ask Siri to name this tune. And there was a great tune playing at TD Ameritrade the other day. And I said, man, that song absolutely rocks. Who is that? So Siri, name that tune. And she gives me one of the songs that's on this list. And I have jammed this album. It is brand new. And it is uh, it is the band that's put together of a son from a rock legend. And so I got the idea, what if we did a Like Father, Like Son list? So that's what I have for you today. Now, this is going to introduce you to some new music. Many of these singers sound like their dads a little bit. But this is a cool list. And I like every track on this. It's a little bit different. We got some country on here. We got some rock on here. But it is the Like Father, Like Son top 10 list. So here we go. Number 10 on the list is, is a cool track. It's, it's, it's kind of like Simple Man a little bit. But it's It Ain't Easy by Shooter Jennings, the uh, son of the legendary Waylon Jennings. Many of you are familiar with his music. I know I've got some friends that have gone to see them, uh, see Shooter and his band play live, and they, they just swear by him. They, they say he's such a good time and guy. That is a really cool song. And uh, talk some about his dad. It's like, you know, kind of life lessons learned and, you know, how life ain't easy. Number 10. Number 9, this is one that was a new band to me. But, man, I dig it. They get their, their first material on their first EP is out. And there is a song called Take a Look by Sons of Albion by Logan Plant. And yeah, you figured it out. That's Robert Plant's son. And uh, sounds enough like Robert that you can make the connection there. But kind of got his own sound. It is a little more of a rocking sound. They've only got a couple tracks out right now. But this song, Take a Look, is a real banger. And I think you're going to dig it. Roy will have this up for you on the list. Take a Look, Sons of Albion, Logan Plant is the singer. Number eight, we're going back to the 80s. The son of one of the, the greatest songwriters in the history of the world. It's Julian Lennon, the son of John Lennon, and the song is uh, Much Too Late for Goodbyes. This, I, I'm, I'm not mistaken, this went number one, and this may have been his biggest hit, and Julian Lennon had a nice little run there for a while, uh, but this was absolutely his best track. Number seven, and this is a band right here that I knew about before I knew that there was a famous son in the band. If you have not listened to Tyler Bryant and the Shakedown, you are you you are doing life wrong. Tyler Bryant and the Shakedown are absolutely legit. The guitar player in that band, Graham Whitford. That's right, the son of legendary Aerosmith guitarist Brad Whitford. You know Joe Perry. Well, Brad's the other guy that's laying down the rhythm, but it's incredible. But the song is on to the next, and it is an absolute wall banger. You will love this song. I think. Listen. If you like rock, if you like a little southern rock, if you like some up-tempo stuff, Tyler Bryant and the Shakedown is for you. You are going to dig this band. Been out a few years now, got a couple albums out. This is my favorite song from them, On to the Next. It is so legit. Number six, and this is the song that uh, made me put this list together. This is what inspired the list. It is a great tune called Don't Back Down by the band Mammoth. You say, Steve, I've never heard of Mammoth. Well, that's Wolfgang Van Halen. That's Eddie Van Halen's son, Wolfie. And Wolfgang has done a lot of stuff. Of course, he filled in when Michael Anthony was dismissed from the band of Van Halen, but also, too, uh, Wolfie did some work with Mark Tremonti on on the Tremonti Project. If you don't know those Tremonti albums, you need to download them today. They are all amazing. It's, It's a little bit heavier than what he's done with Alter Bridge and Creed. It's probably more up his alley. You know, this, like... Alter Bridge pays the bills. Not that his heart's not into it, but the, the Tremonti stuff is kind of truer to, I think, Rock's rock and roll, uh, to Mark's rock and roll heart. I've met Mark Tremonti. He's a tremendous guy. He is the greatest guitar player of this generation. And uh, Wolfie, I, I chased that rabbit trail long enough, but Wolfie has done some stuff on the first couple of Tremonti project albums. Uh, I love that first one more than life itself sometimes. But uh, the song Don't Back Down by Mammoth is an absolute rager. I love this song. I've been jamming it up for the last few days. So the last five songs are not going to be new to you. So the first five were, for the most part, uh, were new. Too too late for goodbyes or what. But four of the first five, probably new to you. 
And that's what we want to do here on the Barnyard is introduce you to new music when we can, but also remind you of great tunes that maybe perhaps you've forgotten about. So here we go. Number five, The Sons of Ricky Nelson. It's Nelson. The song is Love and Affection, the one that started it all. They had the best hair in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Absolutely tremendous. But Love and Affection, After the Rain, all that was good stuff. And other people, well, Steve, it's kind of poppy. It's good stuff, man. Love and Affection is a great tune. The harmonies are great. Uh, I, I love the blend of the acoustic and the electric guitar. It's very well produced. Number four, and I discovered this guy before he died. God rest his soul. And uh, his poor mom has done a lot to try to carry on his legacy. It's an amazing songwriter. A lot of lovers lament stuff. This is a guy that kind of bled onto the uh, onto the guitar, man. He was legit. That's Jeff Buckley, the son of Tim Buckley. And it's the song Last Goodbye, which was my first introduction into Jeff Buckley's music. And his version of, of Hallelujah is, is haunting. But um, if you don't know Jeff Buckley, again, you're kind of doing life wrong. Jeff Buckley, you know, kind of a limited catalog, but uh, was a remarkable songwriter. And there, you know, people respond to authenticity, and that's what I got from Jeff. It's just like he is a guy that he kind of healed himself as best he could through his music because he had gone through some really serious stuff, and he was uh, kind of a hopeless alcoholic. And uh, basically, if I, if I remember the story correctly, he jumped into the Mississippi River and drowned himself during a uh, bout of depression. Don't mean to bum you out there, but uh, last goodbye, a great track. Number three, and uh, this album, when I got this album on cassette back in the day, it was the big day. See, back in those days, back when MTV played music, they would play like singles before the albums were released to build some anticipation for the album. Wasn't like it is today where you go to bed and you wake up and, oh my gosh, there's a new album that's dropped. No, wasn't like that. So you would drop a new video and then everybody's like, oh, I cannot wait to get this record. And of course, everybody would do interviews with Circus Magazine or Cream or Hit Parader or Rolling Stone or whatever. And by the time the album dropped, there'd be a line of people just waiting to get it. Well, this was one of those albums for me. And the name of the album is called The Disregard of Timekeeping by Bonham. Of course, that's Jason Bonham's band. Uh, the son of legendary drummer uh, John Bonham from Led Zeppelin. And the song is Wait For You. It's a track that started it all. But that album, there is not a bad track on it. And so maybe you're un- you're familiar with that song, Wait For You. But the song Guilty on there, I, I think it's the best song on the album. Introduce yourself to that. You know, Jason Bonham's been with a, a few different bands. But this is the one that he kind of put together kind of on his own and uh, really did a great job. But the song Wait For You is, is tremendous. Number two, and everybody knows this song. It seems like the year this thing was out, it was everywhere. And it's One Headlight by the Wallflowers. Jacob Dillon, the son of legendary singer-songwriter Bob Dillon. Uh, Not much happened with the Wallflowers after that. They're they're a bit of a one-hit wonder. They did have a little radio airplay after that with some other tracks. But without a doubt, One Headlight is the one. And I really like his voice. You know, I, I don't know if they just didn't have good songwriters around them or whatever, or they just had irreconcilable musical differences, but they never reached their full potential, I don't think. Uh, but number one, and I, I think we could all agree, I think this is number one with the bullets, and people are sitting here thinking on the edge of their seats, thinking, what's it going to be? Well, it's one of the greatest country music superstars of all time, who is the son of one of the pioneers of the genre. It's Hank Williams, Jr., and if you're going to listen to Hank Williams Jr., you got to start with All My Rowdy Friends Are Coming Over Tonight. That's your number one song, All My Rowdy Friends by Hank Williams Jr. So that's the like father, like son list. Uh, dig the list. And w- I'm going to tell you what I'm going to be excited about. Because I know some of you guys, I hear from so many of you that you hear a band and then you go get into the band. And then the next thing you know, like people are sending me pictures of them, list their, their screenshots of the song. Or they'll say, hey, Steve, I got into this band because you suggested them, which really excites me because I think one of the greatest things that people do for me, when people turn me on to new albums and new bands, and I really dig them, I, that is like one of the greatest gifts you can give me. It didn't cost you a thing. But people will message me and say, Steve, I, I can't believe I've never heard of this band. They're incredible. There is going to be a lot of that on this list. There are going to be some people, I know my inbox is going to be full here in the next couple of days saying, Steve, I just downloaded this Mammoth album. And it is massive, and it is. It does not have a bad track on it. 
I'm really enjoying it. I've just kind of really get, gotten to know it here the last couple of days. It's a relatively new release. But I suspect there are going to be many of you that are going to listen to Tyler Bryant in a shakedown, and you're going to be moved by that because those guys are absolutely talented. I think you're really going to dig it. And I, and that's what excites me about this list is that I know that there's it's kind of a blend of some songs and names you know and maybe some you don't. But because of the fact they come from you know a great legacy of music, that maybe they're worth you giving a listen to. I would not recommend these songs if I didn't believe in them. You go check them out today. And, uh, again, Roy will have the list up, and you'll be glad you did. All right, let's talk a little bit more about Vanderbilt. And uh, this segment of the show brought to you by Campus Bookmart. Stand Man is here. And uh, I told you guys last night, I ran into Stan on the street. We celebrated a little bit, had our pictures taken together, throwing the horns down because we're so happy. And Stan says, listen, they're restocked with uh, World Series shirts. They had run short because you guys have done such a great job buying them up. You know what? They're back in stock. We're good to go. Many of you maybe just couldn't take the trip. Maybe you just couldn't afford it. Or perhaps maybe you couldn't get time off or whatever. For whatever reason, you can still share in the College World Series experience by ordering those shirts from Campus Bookmart. I'm encouraged you to do that today. That's campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. That's BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. And that'll get you free shipping on all orders over 50 bucks. Any order less than $50, absolutely incomplete. Again, Stan the Man is here. He is healthy, doing well. Uh, his wife went into the Facebook Live and asked me to check on him, take care of him. He's great. He's doing really good. And I enjoy seeing Stan. I don't think I've ever seen Stan Ray without a smile on his face. He's always happy. He's always uh, wearing maroon or in some way whatsoever representing Mississippi State. He loves the Bulldogs, and I'm glad that he had the opportunity to get away from the store for a while and come out of here. Stan's a hard worker, man. He really is. That whole staff there is. Uh, and, I, and I had somebody tell me there's a former Diamond Girl that works there, too. I'm going to have to do some investigation there because I'm a big fan of the Diamond Girls. But go check them out, campusbookmart.net, promo code BSR. Let's talk Vandy. I don't know if you guys realize this, but Mississippi State and Vanderbilt – have won the same amount of games, 48. We've lost one more than them because we played more and more than them. We're 48-17 or 48-16. So it's pretty even, right? We went up there and played them pretty even. They beat us Friday, we beat them Saturday, and they won the Sunday game. We didn't play well. We got off to the big start and just couldn't finish. And give them credit, they brought in a relief guy that shut us down. we got to be better. I don't think we had a real sense of urgency then. I think we've learned from that since then. It was a big road series, and a lot of people are thinking, we just got to go up there and get one, and maybe that mentality hurt us a little bit. But it's a good Vanderbilt team. They're not nearly as good as they have been offensively. There is no J.J. Bode in the lineup. You know, there's, there's, there's no uh, Dansby uh, in the lineup. I mean, they, they don't have that guy that can just go out there and just you know, change the way you operate. Now, Carter Young is a guy that can run into some. I, I'm very impressed with him, and I really wish he would go early. <laughs> I mean, I'd... Very, very impressed with him. Very talented shortstop. He's booted the ball around a little bit here in Omaha, but uh, he is a guy very dangerous at bat uh, for sure. So let's run the schedule down here real quick, and then we'll get into some statistics as we guys kind of prepare. And don't forget, too, we did finish a a half game ahead of Vanderbilt in the SEC standings. Had they won that game, it would have been a tie, right? So, again, there's a lot of people out here that are thinking, oh, well, Vanderbilt is just so great. Uh, guys, listen, Mississippi State and Vanderbilt are equal. We're equal on the field. We're equal in just about every statistical category. Uh, we're not equal in scholarship distribution, but we are equal in these in the things that really matter. And, and I'm going to chase this for just for one second because it just infuriates me. Uh, but I had somebody send this to me, uh, one of my friends, and I wanted to share it with you guys in case you hadn't heard it. But... Um, you know, all there's, one of the things that irritates me the most about the scholarship thing is how, how so many ignorant people on the Vanderbilt side suggest so many things that just aren't true. It's almost like they've been brainwashed into believing you know, that they've been on Twitter and message boards enough and somebody doesn't know, but they, they put some things out there that make a little sense. And they support their contention that they're not doing anything that everybody else isn't doing. Uh, and so then they run with it. And the issue is not this opportunity fund thing. That, that's not my problem with them. That, that's not the issue. My problem is the need-based aid. There are five need-based scholarships that have no academic component to them whatsoever. 
and the only reason they're granted admission into Vanderbilt is because they're on athletic scholarship. They wouldn't even meet more times than not. I don't know every case to be, to be this way. In most cases, they would not be admitted to Vanderbilt because they didn't meet the academic requirements. And what's amazing is all they got to do is have be under a certain threshold of income, and they qualify for a 100% scholarship. Now, it's not cheating. It's a loophole the NCAA needs to change. We all get 11.7, and yeah, everybody does a few things out there, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, there's academic scholarships and things like that. But guys, this isn't a little partial academic scholarship. This is a 100% scholarship, and that's five per year. That's not five for the roster. That's five for this year, five for next year, five for the next year, five for the next year. So conceivably, they could have 20. Now, of course, some of those guys obviously go pro after their junior year. So let's just say more times than not, you got 15. So you got 15 scholarships in addition to 11.7. So on a conservative estimate, we're talking about 26, 27 players on scholarship, many of them going to school for free. And nobody from the Vanderbilt side wants to seem to explain that away. And so somebody sent this to me today, and this is a quote from Tim Corbin in, from The Athletic, not from some blogger out there, not from some podunk newspaper. It's The Athletic. And here are his exact words. We have more of an inroad to a kid that is in a lower economic situation who wants to be here and can be here because of his economic situation. Does it hurt us? Yeah, because we don't get every kid we want. But you also understand it's an advantage for us. There is no doubt. That's Tim Corbin himself. And that's what he's talking about. It's need-based aid. He's not talking about the stupid anchor fund or the opportunity fund that's available to everybody. That's not at all what's at issue here. Now, that could be a different issue. We could bark up that tree another day. But the issue is, is that all these young men have to do is to be under a certain economic threshold, regardless of their academic situation, and they can be granted a 100% scholarship. And here's the, the analogy that somebody pointed out to me one time. What do you think would happen in the state of Alabama if it was discovered that Auburn had just one more football scholarship than Alabama? There would be blood in the streets. But nobody cares about college baseball except for us, except for us hardliners. But if it got out and said, okay, listen, hey, Alabama can sign 85 players, but Auburn can sign 90. And Tennessee can sign 90. Do you think there would be meaningful change brought to the scholarship distribution of college football if that was the case? You know it would be because Nick Saban would not rest. But nobody cares about college baseball. That's why I was so glad that Matt Wyatt did the unbalanced documentary, and I think it's kind of opened some eyes to this. But again, it's not – see, that's the thing that pe- people, you know, they, confl- they complicate the issue. It'd be one thing if – these young men had gone out there and were exemplary students and made, you know, 33, 34 on the ACT and 4.0 students and earned a a full academic scholarship. But they're being gifted 100% academic aid and athletic aid for not even being great students, just for basically being underprivileged. And you could say, well, Steve, don't we want those kids to go to school? Sure we do. So let's take those same kids that aren't playing baseball and put them on a scholarship, right? Because the only reason they're getting that is because they can swing a bat or they can throw a pitch. That's the issue. All the rest of this stuff is just details. That's the issue. And you can say, well, Steve, why can't we do it? Well, we can, but it gets really expensive. There's only a handful of schools that do it. Because of their endowment, they're able to fund that need-based aid. So, again, I've chased that rabbit trail long enough. All right, I'm going to get mad if I, if I keep talking about that. Because what's so funny is the way their fans and some of their people are so tone deaf about this, it's offensive. It absolutely is. It's like, oh, you know, because what it is, baseball is all they have. And then when, then when people point out to them, hey, this is a fraud, they're like, oh, well, you can't say that about us. Well, yes, we can. Because it's not a level playing field. It's not a level playing field, and there's no way to make it a level playing field as long as the NCAA leaves that loophole open. Now, Vandy would be a fool to stop doing it as long as the NCAA will allow them. But to suggest, like when I went to Vanderbilt, the lady held up the 11.7 straw. I wanted to go take that sign and rip it in half. What are you trying to do, lady? 
Nobody believes that. Anybody with a brain understands you guys don't have 11.7 scholarships. You got nearly 30 guys on scholarship over there, and everybody else is, you know, we got people going to school for next to nothing. It's stupid. All right, so let's get on to this because I'm going to get mad. <laughs> so, you know, they open a season with the, the Wright State Series, and of course they sweep that, and uh, actually had some trouble scoring, and, and uh, you know, a couple of those games, like one of those games. Uh, they take care of Western Kentucky. They lose to Georgia State early on, four to two. They do, uh, they do bounce back though, and win that series as they should. You remember Georgia State had a lot of SEC wins early in the year. It was a four-game series. They take three of four. They sweep Illinois, Chicago, the powerhouse that is. They take down Memphis. They had a really loud series win at Oklahoma State, which I, I commend them. They absolutely destroyed Oklahoma State in Game Two. Uh, they do lose game three, 10 6, but Kumar was outstanding in game one. They take down Belmont, and then they take two out of three from South Carolina. They struggle with the Sunday game. They win the Friday night game 3 2. Uh, they take down Lipscomb, and then they, they sweep Mizzou, and I'm not going to touch it. Uh, Tennessee Tech, they win that one, and then they sweep LSU in Baton Rouge, and that's when people really realized that the wheels were coming off in Tiger Town. And listen, Everybody expected Vandy to win that series, but Vandy went down and embarrassed them for the most part. Uh, they take down UT Martin, and then they lose the series two out of three to Georgia, and Georgia absolutely destroys Kumar Rocker, 14-2. Leiter gets the win, and, then, and Georgia comes back on Sunday and wins that series in Nashville. They take down Eastern Kentucky, then they win two of three in Knoxville uh, against Tennessee. A very, very good series win there. They actually lost uh, Leiter. They lose lighter start, lighter not charged with the loss, but the uh, bullpen couldn't hold it together. Then they have the Austin P series, and of course they beat us six two. We beat them seven four, and you get into that Sunday game. And I want to just take a, just a quick minute to talk about that Sunday game because I think many people probably need the refresher here, guys. We jumped out there four to nothing in that ball game, four to nothing, and we couldn't hold it. We start booting the ball around, have a chance to get out of the inning. We don't. You know, after the fifth inning, they've taken a 5-4 lead. And listen, we don't score the last seven innings of a ball game. We're going to lose. That's what happened that day. We had chances to blow that game open early, and we didn't take advantage. We really had them on the ropes. They had to go pull their pitcher. Uh, If you recall, they started Patrick Riley, who they may start on Saturday. He goes one-third of an inning against us, has four walks, (laughs) <laughs> two hits, three runs. We absolutely had a chance to blow this thing open. We don't. That's the thing you go back and look at. It. You know, we had a chance to take a really, really big series uh, right there. And in that first inning, I'm going to run it down for you real quick here. Rowdy opens with a walk. T.A. strikes out. Cameron James walks. Hancock doubles uh, to drive in a run. And then they walk Logan Tanner. DeBrew singles. And then we drive in two runs. Cumbus walks. Now the bases are loaded. The bases are loaded here with less than two outs. They pull Riley and, and bring in McIlvain, and then Josh strikes out swinging, and Forsyth flies out the center. So we get deeper in the order there and just can't get the big hit. We had him on the ropes, could have knocked him out. We didn't. We come back there in the second, and um, you know McIlvain had done a really good job. And at this point, you know we had Vanderbilt 1-2-3 there. Uh, Fristo doing a great job for us. You get Bradfield to pop up the first pitch and a couple of K's there. Uh, we come out, Rowdy grounds out, and T.A. homers straight away to center field. So it's a 4 nothing ball game. We feel like, you know what, we have got this thing rolling. Guys, we did next to nothing the rest of the ball game. Really, really struggled to get things going offensively. Never really had a chance to climb back into it. Now, we're a little bit different team than we were back then. And that's another thing that I wanted to point out before we kind of move forward with the schedule here. You know, we have made some changes to the lineup and to our uh, defensive alignment since then. If I can find the box score here. Thanks, Vandy, for making this thing complicated. All right, so we had Rowdy Jordan leading off, TA second, Cam third, Luke four. That hadn't changed. Logan Tanner five, Scotty six. Combus starts, but we pulled him for Braylon Skinner. Josh Hatcher was still at third, and Forsyth was just getting going back then. And listen, he's still struggling to play a little bit. But, you know, we're a much different team today than we were back then. Back in those days, we were still figuring things out defensively. All right, so let's get back on the schedule. Again, we, we gave that game away. 
we, we did. And to their credit, listen, they slowed us down and uh, outscored us because we just we simply couldn't keep it up. Uh, they lose two out of three at Florida like we hoped they would to kind of let us get back in the mix there. They lose to Louisville, so they lost, what, three in a row there. They take, uh, they take two games from Alabama. The Sunday game is canceled. They beat North Alabama 3-2. We talk about offense, right? Look at so many scores. I mean, that's the thing, too. When, you know, some of these ball games you look at, they're just Jekyll and Hyde. And a lot of that has to do with the quality of pitching they're facing. I mean, when you get an SEC play, you want to have your rotation settled, but that hadn't always been the case. You know, Ole Miss had some injuries, and they take two out of three in Oxford. The Sunday game turns into a church league softball game. They won that 13 to 10. But, you know, Sundays in Oxford have been uh, rather interesting because they've had trouble finding a third starter, especially after Gunnar Hogger went out. Uh, they take two out of three from Kentucky. We appreciate Kentucky taking us, taking care of that for us because that allowed us uh, to be the number three seed in the SEC tournament. They get into the SEC tournament, and they beat Ole Miss 5-4. And to Ole Miss's credit, they didn't quit. Vandy loses to Arkansas 6-4, and then they lose to Ole Miss 4-1. They're eliminated. And, and you look at those numbers there, five runs, four runs, one run. They get into their regional, they take down Prez, they take down Georgia Tech, and then they blast Georgia Tech. And then against East Carolina, it's 2 nothing in a 4-1 ball game. So offensively, they're not putting up a ton of runs. They have, you know, they, they've had a decent batting average, but you know, there is some swing and miss in this order. There's no doubt. Yeah, but they're a team, too. It's, they're really, they really play well in their ballpark. It's not a big ballpark. Uh, it's a fast ballpark. Uh, you always get an interesting hop. These guys are 12 and seven away from Nashville, and four and three on a neutral field. So you put that together at 16 and 10 away from their ballpark. They're 32 and six at home. That is a huge difference. Now, of course, it's difficult to go on the road, and this is where I think you guys matter. The dude effect. Now, I don't know if you guys know this. Vanderbilt has a lot more Twitter fans than they do actual fans in the stands. When you go to ball games there, there's just not a lot of people there. It's not a big stadium. They have trouble selling it out. They do. TD Ameritrade holds about 24,000, 25,000. There might be 1,000 Vanderbilt people here, and that may be generous. The rest of it's going to be you guys. There is going to be an ocean of maroon and TD Ameritrade. And you guys have got to be loud. And I mean loud. In the end of the ball game, hanging on every pitch. And in this environment, it's easy to do that because everybody is. And there's some other casual fans of baseball that are going to be there because who wouldn't want to go see the national championship, right? We need to recruit those people to cheer for us. And if that means you got to use your Vanderbilt scholarship story uh, to make that happen, then so be it. But the bottom line is we have to make this. It's going to be a partisan crowd. We have to make this an incredible environment that makes it very difficult on Vanderbilt. They're human. Okay, and there's some very talented players in that lineup. There's no denying that. It's not as talented as perhaps it has been. But these guys are human. And when you guys get rocking with the maroon and white cheer, you got 25,000. Think about this. It's basically double what the dude is, right? Almost. And just imagine what that would feel like if you're out there trying to, to work a count as a pitcher, trying to prevent from walking somebody, and you got 25,000 people in your ear screaming maroon and white top of their lungs. That's a difference maker. We have done a great job as a fan base all for the 10 days we've been here, but these are the days that matter most. And I know many of you have not been here, so you're going to bring some fresh voices. Many of us are running out. We're not a voice, right? And so we need that new exuberance and you guys to come in here absolutely raising seven shades of hell on Vanderbilt. You can be the difference in Mississippi State winning and losing a ball game. I think it's that important. I, th- I think we can make this an incredibly hostile environment. And I don't mean being mean-spirited or things like that. I'm just saying cheer for the team. Kind of get things riled up here. And not to mention get behind your kids. There's a lot of pressure playing at the dude. For everybody involved. But you know what? On the greatest stage in all of college baseball, how cool is it to think that your team is going to be the favored team by the crowd? And it's going to be because you're there. And the fact that there are so many people that don't like Vanderbilt. And so let's turn this into an incredible environment that people talk about forever and a day. 
I think it's that important. I think you guys can be the difference in an out, in a walk, in a run, in a hit, in a win. I think it's that important. Let's look and see who's doing well for Vanderbilt. You know, their average is down, and so is ours. Okay, you know, they, they have not been good offensively for a while. Uh, but, you know, a lot of, again, that's the quality of pitching. We're both kind of in the same boat. So let's look at, you know, the up-to-date stats. Dominic Keegan leading the way with a 359 average, and, and he is an absolute stud. He really is. I don't know that he's a first baseman on the next level. I think it's just where he plays because he's filling a team need. But uh, he's kind of the leader and uh, 15 bombs. You know, second on the team, but uh, he, he's had some big swings here at Omaha. Enrique Bradfield is an absolute monster, and once he figures out that he's not a home run hitter, he'll probably hit 500. I mean, this guy is very, very difficult out. He is not a guy that can hurt you, though. I think this is a guy you challenge him. You make him hit the baseball. You don't nibble with him. You don't let him get up there and bunt. You hammer him, and you challenge him with the fastball. You make him hit his way on, because if you walk him, it's a double. Simple as that. He is the most prolific base stealer in the country, 46 of 52. Uh, I love his game. I really do. I think he's going to play baseball for an awfully long time. But he is a guy that really struggles at time to uh, to handle below. Pound his own, make him hit his way on. Uh, number three on the list, Isaiah Thomas, right fielder. He's been kind of quiet in Omaha. He is actually one of my favorite players on the team. I really like his game. Uh, 315, 13 bombs, just 39 ribbies. He hits a little farther down in the order, so they do a really good job ahead of him. Jason Gonzalez is kind of an assassin hiding down there in the nine hole. 285 hitter. He has not been what they had hoped. I mean, he was the guy I think many people thought would be the next J.J. Bleday, a guy that hits in the heart of that order that uh, can turn a game around for you in one swing. That's just not who he has become. And this is a guy that's a senior. He's come back, tried to improve his stock, and, you know, He's got his education taken care of. But uh, this is a very impressive-looking guy. He is another guy that struggles with the fastball up. Uh, Jack Bolger hitting 276. Uh, not a real threat, you know, he, but he is a guy that kind of moves the order along. Parker Nolan's a guy that has had a really good week. Uh, he That whole right side of the infield, Parker Nolan, Dominic Keegan, have done a really good job for Vandy. They have kind of been the guys that have carried this offense. Carter Young has really struggled in Omaha. And that is surprising. He is their leading home run hitter with 16 and has 15 rubies. This is a guy that that hurt us. We were down there. We were in the ball game on Sunday. Next thing you know, we we kind of nibble around with uh, with uh, Bradfield and he gets a walk. And next thing you know, Park uh, Carter Young hits a bond to put the game away. C.J. Rodriguez, I really believe he is going to be a star at Vanderbilt. Uh, I don't know his draft status. He is one of the better receivers in the country. And when we went to Nashville and watched him play, he was the guy that I walked away from and I was probably most impressed with. I mean, I mean, at that point, you know, Bradfield and Carter Young are kind of known commodities. But I was really impressed with him. Maybe it's because I'm a former catcher. But I like the way C.J. receives the baseball. He's so competitive. But he also is such a difficult out at the plate. This is a guy, you want to talk about running your pitch count up? He's only a 250 hitter. But he is a guy that can stay alive and stay alive and stay alive. And he is so difficult to finish. You know, it's almost impossible to put him in a situation where he's going to strike out a whole lot. And uh, his strikeout numbers are up a little bit, obviously, from when we saw him. But listen, he leads the team. Listen how ridiculous this is. It's almost like Luke Hancock. 17 strikeouts. That's it on the whole year. 17 and 176 at-bats. He has struck out 17 times. Uh, the number two guy of the starters for them is Enrique Bradfield, 39. That's how big a difference it is. This guy's a very difficult out, and he ends up walking a lot too. I mean, he's just one of those guys that just grinds out at bats, 35 walks, which leads a team. I think he's an unsung hero of that team. And I'll be honest with you, the other day, he was the one that got the thing going. They ended up pinch running for him. That was in the ball game against uh, NC State. They were trying to put the game away. Take the catcher out of the ball game, bring a backup catcher in. Next thing you know, it's it's off to the races out there. But this is a guy that is a star, man. And and again, his offensive numbers don't necessarily show it. But this is a guy that is a very, very, very difficult out. All right, so we get a little deeper into this thing. Let's look at pitching here. I mean, it's the usual suspects. I mean, you know, Kumar Rockers fourteen and three with a two point five two ERA, one hundred and seventy three Ks against thirty seven walks. He's just not going to give you a whole lot. Uh, Jack Leiter, 2.08 ERA, 10-4 record on the year. 
His first loss was to us, and then he had some tough times. They shut him down. 171 Ks against 42. The thing about Leiter, too, is he just doesn't give up a lot of hard contact. He doesn't give up, you know, a lot of extra base hits. But when he does, when he does miss up, you can hammer him one out of the ballpark, giving up 13 home runs. And, and what's crazy, guys, he's given up two doubles all year. Think about that for a second. If he keeps you in the ballpark, he's holding you to a single. It's remarkable. He's the best arm in college baseball. Opponents are hitting just 128, so he's getting a ton of soft contact. And you see those home run numbers, and you think, yeah, we can rock this guy. And we actually did hit a couple bombs against him. But the bottom line is, is this is a guy more times than not is going to have you hitting his pitch. He has a lot of great arm side run, and so you're thinking it's fastball center cut. And next thing you know, it's on the handle, and you're hitting a little weak ground ball out to the mound. This guy is electric, but can we hit him? We absolutely can. The main thing with him, too, is you got to be able to run the count up with him and get him out of the ball game. I don't think his bullpen is near what they think it is. I think Maldonado is an absolute stud. You know, people talk a lot about Luke Murphy, um, and he is a guy that's done a good job for them. Chris McElvain is a guy that would beat us in long relief on a Sunday game. But those guys are also kind of susceptible, too. I mean, listen, they're SEC pitchers. And they've, they've done a great job developing those guys. And um, so the reality is, is those we're going to have to face two of the better starters in college baseball. But in many respects, we've already seen them. And I think we'll have a good game plan. I think Jay Gotro, Gotro will have us ready to go. Maldonado scares me a little bit because of that slider. It's just so difficult to stay off of it. It's a tunnel pitch for him. And he doesn't have this electric fastball but he has just enough spin rate on the fastball when he throws a slider. It looks like the same pitch. And next thing you know, you're thinking you're hitting fastball and you're swinging and you're missing by about a foot and a half. Now, we talked a little bit about Riley, Patrick Riley. He's the guy we knocked around a little bit on that Sunday game, knocked him out early. 4.89 ERA, 4-2 and two record on the year. Uh, Chris McElmain is a guy that was good against us, and he's 5-1 and one in relief. Uh, Christian Little is a guy that really struggled here in Omaha against Stanford. He's 3-1 and one with a 4.87. And, again, he's going to be a good, a good player for them uh, long term. But this is going to be about pitching. And these are going to be low-scoring games. Uh, I'll be surprised if they're not. It can be very low-scoring games. And the bottom line is if we don't go out there and walk people, if we don't go out there and make errors, if we just make them hit the baseball and earn it, it's going to be difficult. They're not a prolific offense. I know everybody says, well, you know, Steve – you know, they led the SEC in hitting yet 292. Yeah, but you go back and look at their numbers, you know, in conference play, and you know, they didn't exactly light it up. We didn't either, but they're human. This is not the machine that it was in 2019. You know, they were the best team in college baseball in 2019. There was no question about that. That's not the case. This is a team that we can absolutely play against. This is a team we can absolutely beat. Just kind of looking at some SEC numbers here. You know what Jack Leiter's SEC record is? I bet you don't know. Guys, it's four and two. It's four and two. Nine starts. Four and two. Two point seven two ERA. And uh, ten of those thirteen home runs came in SEC play. And he's allowed just one double in SEC play. It is ridiculous to think about. What a stupid, stupid number. Just one. Kumar seven and two. Uh, in SEC play. I mean, and listen, the, he is legit. There's no, Both of these guys are going to play baseball for a long time, provided they stay healthy. When you look at the hitting numbers, it's a little bit different. And, of course, Enrique Bradfield is the guy that kind of leads the, the pack in SEC play. And a lot of that, I think, is because his game, because of the fact he doesn't try to do too much. And when he doesn't, I think he is very difficult to get out. But uh, he is one of those guys, too, that if you don't go up there and challenge him, he has such a good eye. He's going to let you walk him. He just wants to get on base and still second. He is an absolute freak of a stolen base. I love his game. I do. And I can respect the fact that, uh, how he plays. And, and he's a guy, too, in the outfield. That's a, one of the big reasons that Leiter hadn't given up a lot of doubles is because Enrique Bradfield is an absolute freak gap to gap. So we got to pull the ball. we got to work it out there and string some hits together. Uh, I don't know when we're going to do the next show. We'll see. If we win the ball game tomorrow night, we'll do a show. How about that? Um and we'll go ahead and preview the rest because I think it's only right if we're going to be playing for a national championship that we have another show to talk about that. But I like the matchup. I, I really do. I, I'm not scared of Vanderbilt like some other people are. I think they're vulnerable. I think they're a team that has struggled uh, to really do some things defensively here, and they have been very fortunate. As I mentioned on the show last night, you know, they, they, they beat Arizona 
because Arizona's not in double play depth. And then Gonzalez hits that, that ball back up the middle. It would have been a routine double play ball and gets him out of the inning. But for some reason, Jay Johnson's playing him up. That's a coaching mistake, and Vanderbilt took full advantage. But if you're playing baseball there, you know, who knows what happens in that ball game? Then they lose one nothing to NC State. And then you turn around and you play the Stanford game and you're one strike away from elimination. And to give them credit for battling back, but, you know, if we if we execute a pitch right there, Vanderbilt's at home. We're playing somebody else. We're probably playing Stanford this weekend rather than Vanderbilt. I don't know if it's a better matchup for us or not, but Vanderbilt has been on the cusp of elimination, uh, you know, much of the tournament. You know, they have not played well in Omaha, and I hope that continues. And my hope is, is that the disappointment that we have experienced this year at times will kind of fuel us to do some greater things. I think we're certainly capable of winning an AFL championship. Uh, I think all of you guys feel the same way or you wouldn't be here to do it because if you didn't think we would do it, you would stay home. But you've invested your time, your money, your effort, your mileage, and you're up here to watch Mississippi State compete for and win an AFL championship. So my hat is off to you, and I can't wait to see all you guys. All right, before we get out of here, this last segment of the show brought to you by Portico. Portico, a great new residential development in Starkville. And listen, the people that have already moved in, absolutely raving about it. They love the place. You will too. Many of you have always said it's you know it's your dream to move back to Starkville or to move to Starkville and be close to Mississippi State. Listen, it's the best entertainment dollar in town is Mississippi State. There's always something going on. You go to basketball games, go to women's games, go over there and watch them play tennis, come to football. Go to baseball. I mean, what else would you rather do? We got a movie. We got a movie theater. If you want to go do that, you can go over to Old Waverly and play golf. But we love it there in the Golden Triangle. You will too. But Portico is absolutely the best place to go when you're coming to town on 82. You take that turn on 12, like going towards campus. It's the first right. It's Pat Station Road. Turns into Garrett Road as it crosses Old West Point Road, and then there's Portico. And that sounds complicated, but it's as simple as this. It's the first right. And then there's your new pre- there's your new your, your new home in Portico. Uh, you got several options to choose from: two bedroom, two bath, up to four bedroom, four bath. Great floor plan, great neighbors, great community, and you're right there by that new neighborhood Walmart. You're a mile from campus. What could be better than that? If you're a true Bulldog fan, wouldn't you want to be near the action? And you're not going to be so close to campus that uh, you know it's not like living in the Cotton District where you're going to have to deal with you know a lot of college activity in that respect. It's going to be close enough for convenience, but far enough away that you can have a little privacy. I'm going to encourage you to call my friend, Brooks Bryan. And he's not just my friend, he's your friend too. Uh, Brooks Bryan, former Diamond Dog outfielder. Just a tremendous guy, man, on his way here right now. Uh, probably here by the time you guys hear this show. But Brooks will give you all the information. And you know what? Maybe if you're not ready to make the move, maybe you're just thinking about it. And you're saying, you know what? I want to go pitch this idea to my significant other and say, hey, listen, this is what I really want to do, and i got some information for you. Brooks can give you all the ammunition you need. Give him a call today, 601-416-8075. And you know what? If you're so invested in the World Series right now, maybe you save that number. If you have questions, message me on social media. I'm happy to send it to you. It's 601-416-8075. Portico, a great place to live. Starville, a great place to live and play. Uh, make Portico your next move. Let's talk a little football recruiting. There was an announcement earlier today that Cam East, offensive lineman out of New Orleans, was going to announce his decision at 5 p.m. on Monday. We fully expect that to be Mississippi State. I, I made a post over on a Gene's page message boards a couple of days ago. I said, hey, we're under a commitment watch. That's what it is. We're waiting for that decision. He came up with his family and uh, took some time. His mom, his grandma with him, toured the campus, got to talk with the coaches a little bit. And then, of course, as soon as the visit's over, now it's time to make a decision. That's always favorable to the team that he just visited last. Now, Trevion Williams is a guy that's the same situation. You know, we thought we were in good shape there, and I don't think that's over by any stretch of imagination. He goes to Florida State, commits on his visit. He is a bit of an impressionable young man. He is will continue to be recruited hard by Auburn. Uh, Ole Miss and Mississippi State. And again, I don't think that's over by any stretch of imagination. To be honest with you, I think that is a knee jerk commitment. He is a guy that still plans to take some visits. From what I'm told, he will take some visits and we'll see. But I think that one's just probably going to go all the way down to National Signing Day. He is an absolute star there. But Cam East is a guy I expect to be in the Bulldog class very, very soon. 
I continue to hear that Stone Blanton will likely make a decision in July and more than likely definitely by August. I still like where State stands with him. I know that he is a guy that's gone out and kind of enjoyed the recruiting process, and he has earned that. I don't begrudge that of anybody. Uh, Stone is in regular contact with your staff in Mississippi State. They know exactly what the lay of the land is with him. But Stone Blanton is the future of your defense. Stone Blanton is the future leader of the Mississippi State defense. And so I think the sooner he commits, the better, because I think he'll help be a drawing card to kind of help recruit. Now, I'm going to be interested to see what happens with these July camps, too, because we had some guys come that hadn't worked out. You know, we had we had a couple guys come that a little bit banged up and probably shouldn't have worked out the first time. But, you know, listen, I think before, you, before you're going to sign, you're going to have to go work out for your coaches, right? I mean, there's some guys out there that are – you know, they're probably no doubt prospects, but, you know, your coaches want to see how you move and have an opportunity to work with you and see how you accept coaching. So and there's probably some names on, on the commitment list that need to come out and have a good show in July. And, and I just say that because of experience. I mean, we've had guys in the past that uh, had, didn't come to camp, and next thing you know, they're no longer commitments. You know, and that's kind of synonymous with that too. I mean, short of a guy being just a complete no-doubter, you know, if you're a mid-level three-star type guy and, and there's some other guys out there with comparable ability, you need to come to camp and kind of show what you can do to kind of affirm your decision and also to kind of confirm the staff's evaluation of you. And you should never be scared to compete. I, I'm, I'm always leery about guys that are scared to, you know, get out there and run. And maybe if you don't want to run the 40, I get it. But you got to get out there and go play one-on-ones. you got to get out there and compete and show that you got a little fire in the belly. That always makes me nervous when guys do that. Because when it's fourth and goal on the one in the egg bowl, what's that guy going to do? Is he going to compete or not? Coach Eric Collins told me one time, he goes, you know, Steve, if they don't bite his puppies, they won't bite his dogs. And I believe that 100%. That's not just in football, but in life. If people don't learn to be aggressive early on, they're not going to develop that skill when they get to college. They're not going to develop that skill as adults. I mean, there are a few things in life that will change you and jade you a little bit, and you'll change your direction and – uh, live your life but when it comes to sports either you have it or you don't either you're going to go out there and attack and jump on somebody or you won't so we'll see what happens with these july camps i'm eager to get as much fun as i'm having here i'm looking forward to that too and, and uh, i give paul jones a lot of credit he and mitch and gene have kind of had to handle all this stuff matter of fact gene was over in a uh, as a baseball tournament this weekend and uh, the weekend before, he was at a, a football combine, you know. And so we're out there beating the bushes trying to find you guys some content and get you information on the next group of Bulldogs. And uh, But I'm, I'm eager to kind of get back and join the fray, but not at the expense of all this. You know, we're having a great time here. Robbie and Dave and I are doing, I think, a ton of content. And much of it is free. So if you're a Jeans Page subscriber, you're getting some VIP stuff. But, you know, we've also got some stuff over there that we can share with the rest of the Bulldog family. If you hadn't done so, let me encourage you to go and subscribe to Gene's page. At the very least, go like our Facebook page, and that's listed under Bulldogs 247 Sports. That's B-U-L-L-D-A-W-G-S, Bulldogs on 247 Sports. And all of our content on there is free. Everything. A lot of DAC updates, a lot of stuff too, a lot of things the network generates. We put it over there, things that we think that you'll find of interest. So you can uh, kind of have some more maroon on your feed there. I want to thank you guys again for Blooms of Oleander being on the Mississippi bestsellers list. It is, uh, you know, it's one of those things that's very humbling to me that uh, you guys have been so supportive, and I appreciate that. And there are many of you that said, hey, listen, I'm waiting for you to get back from Omaha so you can sign my book. You can go ahead and order those at Book Martin Cafe in Starville. You can call them. There's no online order for them. Just call them and say, listen, I want Steve to sign a book for me. They'll take care of all that for you. And when I get back later this week, I'm going to sign those, and they're going to ship them out for you. If you don't care about personalization, go to Amazon or booksandmegan.com or Barnes & Noble, and you can order the book directly from that and have them delivered to you. Or if you'd like to order from your own local bookstore, you can do that too. Just tell them you want Blooms of Oleander by Steve Robertson. They can find it on Ingram. They'll know exactly what that means. If you're looking for the other books, go to alphadogsthebook.com. Many of you have, and, uh, you know, Everybody involved with that part of the production of the book is in Omaha. So if you've ordered here in the last few days, just be patient with us. Once we get back, we'll get those orders processed for you and get them signed and get them out in the mail. But, uh, listen, it's been a great run for sure. And, um, you know, my hope is is that I've got another book to write uh, here at the end of the week. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know exactly what I'm saying there. I hope that we have something very special that we can celebrate together and that I plan to commemorate that, you know, for forever. Uh, and so we'll have more about that. Hopefully, Mississippi State wins a national championship. And I'll be honest with you guys, too. I'm not nervous. And, and 
that doesn't really make me nervous. You know, a lot of times I am nervous, but maybe it's because we're not facing elimination yet. We're guaranteed two games, but I just feel like we're going to do it. I just feel like it's our time. You know, I had I, I talked with Johnny Hayes, you know, beginning of the week, and it's like, you know, Steve, he said, this is our time. And I believe that. I really do. I believe this is our time. And you know what? If we don't pull it off, I'm not going to be disappointed with the season, but I'm going to be disappointed that we have to come back again. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I don't want to come all this way just to come all this way. We didn't come all the way up here just to win three games. We've done that before. We've never won four, and we certainly had won five. We just got to win two of the next three. Like we talked about a few days ago. We just needed to win three of the next five, but we did. We found a way to win the bracket. We did. And now it's as simple as this. We have to go beat somebody that we know two out of three times. A team we should have beat two out of three times at their place the first time. Now, they're going to pitch us different. They're going to attack us different. We're going to attack them different. But we're not playing at our place. We're not playing at their place. We're playing at TD Ameritrade in front of a very partisan crowd. And I really think we're going to do it. And I look forward to being back with you guys soon. And hopefully it's tomorrow night and we're talking about the Bulldogs have won. And then on Tuesday, we'll have an opportunity to play to bring home a trophy. For those of you that are here, God bless you for being here. For those that you couldn't make it, God bless you for your support anyway. This is our shared love and our shared passion. And there are a lot of people that would do anything to be here and just simply can't. And so for those of you that are here, cheer for them too. Now let me remind you too, if you can't make it and you're going to watch the finals at home, watch them with somebody you love because we're going to make some memories you are going to last us a lifetime, win or lose. I'm a firm believer in family. I'm a firm believer in the, in, in the people you love, making memories with the people you love. And I spend a lot of time on the road out here by myself and uh, it's often, oftentimes it is a lonely job, but there is no place in the world I would rather be right now than Omaha, Nebraska. My sons and his family are coming up tomorrow to join me, and uh, I've already thought about how I will handle it, but uh, it means a lot to me that uh, he will be here because, uh, you know, there have been many times in my life that I've just, you know, I've just wondered, you know, it's, uh, I think about how the expectations have, have raised in my lifetime. I remember when I was a kid, it was just kind of like we were just kind of happy to go play a game and win every once in a while. But now here we are routinely playing for national championships in multiple sports at times. It's our fourth fourth national championship since 2013. We're going to chance to play for that. And you back in the late 70s, early 80s, that was unheard of. What, Mississippi State, we're a national championship? Are you crazy? But here we are. And I, to be honest with you, as much as I love my dad and my grandparents, I'm glad this is in my dad's Mississippi State. I'm, I'm so glad. And he, would, he wouldn't want that for us either. And your dad and your grandpa wouldn't either. They would be do anything to see this happen for us. Because that's what they always wanted. They wanted Mississippi State to be competitive in all fields and courts of play. And we're getting there. And we're doing some amazing things. Our highs are really high. But it's time for us to get the highest of all highs, and that's a national championship. And I believe we're going to do it. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies, and people can see a difference in the way we live. Better sleep means a better you. That's why Mattress Firm made the Rest Assured Promise, featuring the best mattresses from America's best brands. For a limited time, save $500 on Temper Breeze mattresses and sleep 8 degrees cooler. Plus, get a $300 instant gift good towards sleep accessories. Our sleep experts have over 200 hours of training, so you can rest assured we'll find the right bed for you. Only at Mattress Firm, America's number one Tempur-Pedic retailer. Offer valid with qualifying purchase. Restrictions apply. Valid at participating locations only. For offer details, visit mattressfirm.com sale.